Kia ora he uli tēnei o Te Ate Awa me Tarana Ki, ko Alice to Puna Samuel Lahau. Um, I teach at the Faculty of Māori and Indigenous Studies at the University of Waikato and one of the great joys of the last three years of my life has been um, a Marsden funded project called Writing the New World, Indigenous Texts 1900 to 1975. The project um, spends time going all around the region, 1900 to 1975, a period that we actually don't know that much about. We spend a lot of time talking about kind of first adventures and connections with Europeans coming into the region, and we talk about more recent things, but particularly in the area of writing and literary studies, which is my own background, um, it's kind of like what really happened between you know, the end of the kind of contact colonial period and Albert went, like, what, what happened in that time in between? Writing the New World um, has brought together 16 different Indigenous uh, researchers from all around the region with really different backgrounds um, and different perspectives and different skills. Um, and the podcast is intended to feature their views, their ideas, their experiences, so that you also can have an opportunity to connect um, with this writing, but also with the region that it comes from. The whole concept of the podcast is so much that happens at universities, um, really are, are things that people beyond the university might be interested in hearing about. We're interested in celebrating the writing from this time period, but also celebrating the work of the amazing researchers that have worked on the project. And so we are hopeful that members of their communities and the members of the communities um, that produce this writing in the first place um, would find these podcasts to be interesting and maybe um, would have them um, ask some questions and feel interested in knowing a bit more about the writing of their own communities. In order to contribute to the New Zealand um, Pacific and Māori Language Weeks, um, in 2020 a special issue of the podcast is being launched um, with each of those language weeks um, featuring people from those language communities um, speaking about their research in that language. <laughs> My name is Wanda Yerma Allen, and today's podcast, the second of the Tawalunga series, in which Amon Apiata and I interview Associate Professor Alice de Puna Somerville, we will be discussing archives, structural inequality, and the way in which institutions are rethinking access, privilege, and in Indigenous peoples' writing. Alice talks about the importance of those in power to be deliberate in the hiring of Indigenous researchers. She talks about the key contributions of Māori and Pacific Indigenous researchers and the methodologies applied to produce and reimagine new research outcomes. and enjoy. So Alice, I wanted to ask you, extending from that kōrero about, um, about racism, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about archival practices and um, and how <laughs> Sorry. I... racism, archival practices. <laughs> yes, the connections yes. are very close. Yes, yep. yes, the connection between um, <laughs> archival practice and how writing has, in some way, someone made a claim about writing being a form of enslavement, um, and archives are practicing that that form. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So. Um, so a big part of this project has been the connection with the archives um, and I've thought a lot about the archives. I also did quite a bit of archival work leading up to this project. Um, I kind of, um, a, a very good friend of mine, Nadine Atwell, who's a, um, uh, who's a Canadian-based Canadian scholar um, and I um, talk about this a lot, how we kind of literary studies trained um, but actually do a lot of kind of archival work have kind of ended up um, zipping into things. Not that we're trying to pretend to be like fake historians, um, but it's more just that um, we're interested in the in the writing that exists in archives. Um, when we talk about archives, just to kind of be kind of big picture about it, sometimes when we think about archives, we think, oh, that would be the building in Wellington, which is called New Zealand Archives. Um, that is one kind of archive. Um, and that's, that's the one that stores all the documents connected to the New Zealand government. Um, 
but there are other kinds of archives as well. So when I'm talking about archives, I mean it quite broadly. So I'm including like libraries, um, lots of institutions like the Auckland Museum or, you know, different universities will have kind of a library and archive connected to whatever it is that they do. And, um, and they will also have some, um, some text, some unpublished work, but also published work um, sort of saved there. Um, uh, there are other kind of less formal archives you might think of um, and some of them would be like personal collections and some of them would be kind of Fano or um, organization held colle um, collections so there's kind of um, it says some you know Fano will have like a bookshelf or a box or whatever that's got all the stuff in it <coughs> through to um, some institutions um, or some individuals will have a particular archive um, so we're, we're filming these, um, a lot of these podcast episodes in my office and we could say that um, the bookshelves behind me and all around me um, are themselves a kind of archive. Um, most of the things here um, might not show up in something called like with archives over the door because it's usually like more documents and stuff like that and most of the stuff is published. But this is the only place in the world where this stuff has all been brought together into one place, right? And a lot of the books that I have in my office are um, out of print you can't you know you can't just go down to Wickles and buy it you can't go to Amazon and order a copy it's out of print and has been for a long time for a lot of a lot of indigenous texts even when they're published you know they might only be 500 copies or 300 copies or a thousand copies and then that's it and if you miss that man it's like sorry you've got to take a photo on your phone if you want to have a copy of that thing because there's no other books out there so we can think about archives in all of these different ways um, one of the places where this became really um, sharp for me was um, last year I spent three months um, in different libraries and, and kind of archives. Um, one month was in Australia and uh, two months were in Fiji. Um, in Australia I went to all um, kind of formal archives, so state libraries of New South Wales and Victoria, the National Library of Australia, um, University of Sydney Library, um, Australian National University Library, University of Melbourne Library, so like kind of libraries of major institutions or um, which is code for have really massive collections um, and the money to maintain them um, and, and also these kind of state libraries which are kind of you know connected to sort of archive, um, archives as well or the National Library. Um, so we got a, I got a whole lot of stuff there and then I went over to um, Fiji and I spent most of my time um, in Fiji. I, I was given an office in English at the uh, University of South Pacific Lothala campus in Suva and what I ended up doing was spending most of my time in the Pacific Collection at the USP Lothala campus library because they have a phenomenally, phenomenally ridiculous amazing Pacific Collection and I was just working my way through the stuff, you know, so okay cool. Um, taking photos, having a look, um, so much stuff has come out of that campus. Um, so many of our writers from the region um, have come out of that campus or through that campus. Um, there are a lot of really interesting Māori, New Zealand Māori connections with that campus. And so one of the things that, um, that I was interested in doing was kind of seeing all this work, right, that I wouldn't be able to see, you know, in any other place. All of this writing all of these periodicals, all of this, right, all of this stuff. Amazing, amazing. And then um, about a month in, maybe, of my time in Fiji, um, I got to connect with um, Paul Gerati, who is a very, um, I'd say, widely um, respected and kind of cherished member of the Fiji community. He's not Indigenous Fijian himself, but he has for many, many, many years um, been a, an expert um, on the Fijian, the Indigenous Fijian language, um, and has been very generous, um, as I understand it, in the way that he has um, kind of um, done this work and then made it available. So like on Monday nights when we're in Fiji, you can like watch him on TV and he's like telling people about aspects of the, you know, the different meta, the different dialects around Fiji and so on. So really fascinating stuff. Anyway, um, he has a Fiji language archive, which is like um, in an office in the department 
in, at the University of South Pacific, just across the kind of, there's like a gully and a coffee shop and a little thing. And then there's the like official library. And then you come back to the department and there's like, um, you know, Professor Paul Gerity. And then there's this little um, uh, office across from him that has got a PhD student working in it and it's full of his books. And he has a bookshelf probably about the same size as the one behind me. Um, which is all indigenous Fijian publications. He had all of these publications that I had been like, you know, going over to the, across the, across the way in the USP library, you know, like having a look through. Um, and I'd been like, oh, um, oh, I'd like to borrow that one, please. Okay, so fill in the thing and, you know, put your stuff in the, in the lockers and, you know, da -da. and, and Paul Geraghty was like, oh, do you want to go spend some time in my archive? Mm -hmm. Um, and it was amazing. I mean, it's not the same. It's not the same thing. It's a different collection. And we we spoke about that, you know. And I said, you know, because his interest was in also um, Vakaviti, um, the Fijian language. All of his texts were in the Fijian language, so they were from all over the paddock. Mm. Um, quite a few of them were um, church or religious uh, materials. There were some like um, flyers for like political candidates who, you know, that, that on their flyer it was in Fijian, so we collected that. Um, but then a lot of historical texts, there's a rich and fascinating history um, which I've enjoyed kind of connecting with through this project um, of translations of colonial no uh, novels um, from English into different um, indigenous Pacific languages. And he had a whole bunch of the Fijian ones, so you have kind of King Solomon's Mines and, you know, Robinson Crusoe and uh, all the rest, um, and they're there. Um, on the shelf. Now, if you go over to the USP library, um, Robinson Crusoe is with the other Robinson Crusoes. Um, King Solomon's Mind is with all the other writer Haggards. And the Fiji language kind of newspapers will be with the periodicals. And so they're all over the place, yeah? Within the logic of Paul Geraghty's bookshelf, his archive, um, you know, those things all belong in the same place because they're being used in the same, uh, in the same, uh, uh, according to his kaupapa. Yeah. So one of the things that's really important for me is remembering that there's all different kinds of archives and they're all collected according to the logic of whoever has been collecting them or working there or whatever. They all serve the needs of the institution or the person or the whānau that um, has decided that they want to collect these things together because that's what an archive is. It's a collection of, of text or things that, that's important to telling the story of the institution or the individual or the whānau that's collected them. Um, so when it comes to uh, then the politics, because the question was about racism and, and colonial connect, collection, uh, archival collections, there's a few layers to the, the politics um, uh, there. One is the questions around what's actually collected in the first place. Um, so one of the things which has been kind of back-breaking, um, bibliographical and, uh, you know, physical... Uh, labour for a lot of researchers connected to this project is actually going to a whole lot of different places um, to actually find, you know, one issue there, one issue there, one issue there because um, particular institutions haven't valued the idea of collecting, you know, this particular periodical, this particular publication, right? And so one way that um, we see kind of racism, if racism, if one one expression of racism is kind of the prioritising of the dominant culture and a lack of interest in the things that matter to other people, right? Um, then that's one of the ways that that kind of becomes expressed in archives, the fact that the archival work is so much harder, right? Mm. Um, you know, Te Aho has been like collected, it's been be it's beautiful, it's been put together, digitised, da, da 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 because it's a crown, you know, magazine, right? So New Zealand state is interested in having that one available, but there are all these other publications that are really very hard to track down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that there are a lot of archives that are really thinking carefully about how they um, respond to the fact that turns out there's a whole lot of stuff that's produced by and of interest to indigenous communities um, that they have, and they're like, oh, how do we how do we respond to that? Because are we kind of like those museums with like just heaps of stolen stuff and we should think about how this should really be connecting with the communities? 
and people engage with this um, in archives in different ways. So for some people they have like particular policies in place, um, there's a kind of hospitality and generosity shown and certainly I and I know some of the other researchers on this project have experienced that generosity where people are like like so excited, um, you know, that Indigenous people are interested in coming and doing this work. Um, but that's, you know, always to be balanced with the fact that ultimately the people with the senior roles in archives and libraries tend not to be Indigenous people. And so that has a whole lot of flow and effects. A lot of the labelling of um, these texts is incorrect or insufficient for us to even understand what's there. Um, some, people, some things are being described um, in the record when you like look up on the catalogue to see what's there they're described as being in a different language than they're actually in mm. or um, there are typos um, I remember um, being really surprised that one quite large library seemed to think that it didn't have anything by Witsi Ihi Maira mm. and it's because they had accidentally typoed his name as Ihi Maiva mm. and the person couldn't understand why I'd be a little bit like we don't even have a V in our language dude mm. and this person was like uh <laughs> I mean, at the point at which you are um, misspe misspelling the name of a major writer, mm -hmm. you don't really know about what letters are in which language. So, um, you know, so so there's, there's a need for more Indigenous people to actually move into these areas, mm -hmm. um, to become archivists, to become librarians, mm -hmm. um, and to work with these collections mm -hmm. to help support those non-Indigenous people in there to kind mm -hmm. of develop um, their thinking mm. and sometimes for dominant culture people um, the way that you learn about indigenous stuff is you learn about the many limits of your own knowledge mm. and the many places where you step back and let someone else mm. do something. I would add though that that's true for any person actually mm. and one of the really um, important learnings for me as an indigenous mm. researcher mm. through my whole career but again exacerbated in this project is the many the many points where I go, just because I'm an indigenous person doesn't mean I've got the backstage pass to everything. I don't know everything instinctively or intuitively and I don't know which conversations matter, which questions are most important to particular communities I'm, and it would be kind of colonial of me to make those assumptions. And so then the question becomes, how do I also learn my limits as a researcher um, and step back and let, let the research go in whatever direction it needs to go in? Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of work to be done in the area of, uh, of thinking about archives. I think that um, part of it is about expanding our view of what counts as an archive. Um, part of it is around understanding the logics of archives and part of it is around the people connected to archives. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that can sometimes feel a bit frustrating is that we're talking here about publications. We're not talking about, um, you know, private letters and mm -hmm and documents and so on that are unpublished. Mm. We're talking here about things that were published, mm. so there was a view, an expectation, a hope, an assumption that they would be publicly available, because that's mm. what happens when you publish something because you want people to read it. Yeah. And it breaks my heart a little bit when you sit in an archive and you're reading something and you think, my goodness, this amazing thing that was, you know, intended to be read by um, all of these people, um, you have to have an incredibly elite education. You have to have a job that enables you to take, you know, time away from the desk. And, you know, um, there are all of these barriers that are partly about class, about education, about race, about gender, all these different barriers that mean this thing that was meant to be read by all these people is only being read by a little elite me. Mm. And that's, you know, that, that is one of the kind of heartbreaking things. Mm. And um, to the extent that I do... Um, now feel um, you know it's more important than either, ever that we think about doing things like carefully and respectfully and thoughtfully not just kind of like in a massive you know enthusiastic inappropriate swoop but kind of republishing work and bringing it back into the public sphere mm. um, you know the these first novels I mean Makutu, this novel that comes out from the Cook Islands, of course, hello, Cook Islanders getting mm. all the gold medals. Yeah. Um, Makutu that comes out in 1960 by Tom and Lydia Davis, mm. a really incredible novel, mm. totally out of print. You need to have at least $250 in your back pocket to be able to um, afford one of the very, very few copies that are floating around, kind of mm. used uh, um, and antique bookstore sites on, online. Mm. Um, it's just, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's devastating to think. 
um, I actually shared Makatu with one of our student researchers, Yutu, and um, I said, just read it. Just tell me what you reckon. Just mm -hmm. just enjoy it. Don't don't think of it as research. Just I'm just curious to know how it reads, you know, to like mm -hmm. a young, you know, Pacific student, da da da. And she was like, oh my gosh, it was such a page turner. I couldn't put it down, you know, and you think, mm -hmm. All of that work to produce this incredible novel, which is now, oh my gosh, my math is terrible, um, 60 years old. Mm. And to think that it's not, you know, mm. um, The Crocodile from Papua New Guinea. Mm. Um, how do we get a copy of that? Mm. Miss Ulysses of Puka Puka. Mm. These are novels. I mean, these are things that, mm. you know, are, are, are hefty, mm. um, but should be able to be accessed, yeah? Mm. So... Um, yeah, so that, that's another way that we see that archives can kind of, um, in some ways, um, inadvertently um, uh, act in concert with other forms of oppression, dispossession and marginalisation. That means you have to be a really, really elite, privileged person to be able to connect with these things that our people wrote for us to read. Oh, well, thank you. And in some ways, I guess the podcast is very similar, similar in terms of that kōpapa, is to actually make, uh, provide a forum for this connection. Um, is that the intention of the podcast, Alice? Yeah, so the podcast is really about, um, partly about profiling, yeah, the, the massive amount of amazing writing that's out there from this time period, um, produced by Indigenous people uh, from these places. Um, but part of it is about... Um, you know, make, making this stuff known. And then part mm -hmm. of it is about um, kind of, I guess, highlighting or hopefully demonstrating the way that um, it's possible to consciously and deliberately, when you are in a position of power, which an academic is, um, to be able to try and think deliberately about working against some of these structural inequalities. So one of the things that I've loved about the Marsden funding is I've had scope there to um, get a whole lot of people to come and work on the project for varying degrees of time. Mm -hmm. um, and people have been able to bring their kind of their, their thinking with them. Um, but some of these people are people who have been kind of, who might not be considered um, to be like, oh, researchers working on a, you know, Marsden research project, you know, like often, you know, this kind of big scale funding, it'll be like, oh, you know, you get PhD students and mm -hmm. postdocs and, you know, whatever. And, and I talk to people sometimes and they'll be like, oh, I'd probably need someone who's got at least this much training in this discipline. And, but actually, if one of the things that we're interested in doing is bringing people into research communities um, who are not ultimately just replicating the current dominant research community, um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to do that. And so mm -hmm. hopefully, my hope is that some people will hear this podcast mm -hmm. um, who are in a position to um, use some of their power mm -hmm. um, to think, oh, actually... Um, wow, look at the amazing contributions that Māori um, and Pacific researchers can make. And sometimes those researchers might be undergrads and some mm. of them might be masters or PhDs or just finished mm. their PhDs mm. or just finished their masters. Mm. Some of them might be creative writing trained or law trained or psych trained or mm. whatever. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, but I also hope that there'll be other people that will listen to the podcast who will be a Māori person or a Pacific person and they'll say, oh, I can actually do that work mm -hmm. because I've heard someone talk about doing that work and it, it feels to me like my pathway could take me there as well because mm -hmm. um, that's the other way that we kind of challenge these and dismantle these structures of power is that we, um, we ignore them. We go, nah, stuff it. Even mm -hmm. though everything here assumes that you have to be a dominant, you know, mm -hmm. white, middle class, da 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 da, da man to do this work, um, I, as a young, indigenous woman, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever circumstances, I can do this work too, and I have a contribution to make. Mm -hmm. And not just a cultural contribution, an intellectual contribution. Mm -hmm. And I want to be really clear about that, because when I talk about things like language capacity and cultural capacity, I'm not talking here about thinking about indigenous researchers as just kind of reliable native informants, mm -hmm. almost like human translators, you know, but I'm talking here about the idea of understanding 
indigenous people as intellectuals being able to make an intellectual contribution to to any research project um, and that's really important to me um, there's too much make the make the indigenous person the cultural consultant because they've got my lineup of you know fully whatever it's like no 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 we, we need to understand that indigenous people indigenous texts indigenous languages these are all intellectual they have intellectual dimensions. Mm. Um, I love the fact that there's going to be a master's thesis coming out in Te Reo Māori. Mm. I love the fact that, you know, you guys are both doing work, working with these indigenous archives. But I definitely don't think that if I'd subbed in any other Samoan speaker or any other Māori speaker, that it would be like the same process. Because you're not just Google Translate for your people, mm. right? That's not mm. the work. It's mm. it's about saying this is an, this is an and, mm. in addition to. Mm. And it's also a process by which the intellectual work can happen, yeah? Mm. Um, I don't think my generation of scholars um, uh, is... Is the end point? Mm. I think that we're uh, we're we're still in a in a, a period where we're still starting to understand um, and imagine where research and scholarship can go. Mm. Um, uh, because I'm not social science trained, mm. and my um, my focus is on social science research, the conversations about kind of rushing off and interviewing the community or only answering questions that emerge from the community, those are not the questions that animate my research. Mm. They're really important, but that connects to some research projects. That doesn't connect to mine, because unfortunately nobody from the Māori community, including my own Māori community, has ever rang me up and gone like, oh, Alice, there's a poem, we need it translated mm. and interpreted right now, mm. like immediately. There's we, We're just trying to decide some point here about the <laughs> metaphor, and it's an emergency. You know, like that's, you know, this is not that kind of research. Um, but this is research where rather than um, thinking about indigenous communities as being kind of um, people that we're researching with in that sense, um, for this kind of project we're understanding that in the archives are the words of indigenous communities. Yeah, and in the archives we our communities have already spoken to us. They've been speaking to us for you know, a couple of hundred years in many cases in the region, including here in Aotearoa. And so engaging with the community sometimes does look like trotting off to the library, reading some books, um, thinking about this in relation to other things that we've read, um, finding some periodicals, um, putting them all together, um, and sharing some of that thinking um, about that and the fact that that work had been out there. So for me, ultimately, that's what this podcast um, is about. Uh, no, last question, uh, and related to that, uh, a question I did have that uh, is is often repeated um, as part of your um, corridor and your encouragement is, the text is brainier than the person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's true. Can yes. you please? I know you've just talked <laughs> ar around that, and I like, <coughs> could you please explain <laughs> as a continuation of your corridor now what that means yeah so um it sounds terrible it sounds like i just spend all my time telling people they're dumb <laughs> it's not that but um i have actually in some classes stood there and said everyone has to say the text is brainier than me um <laughs> the point here is about um you know this is a particular kind of research and it's a research which where the text is at the center and our job is not to rush in and to tell the text what it means our job is to respond to and to think carefully about the meaning that is produced through our relationship with the text. Yeah, and the text is always going to be able to mean a lot more things than what we just think it means because someone else is going to come along and it's going to mean something else mm. to them. They're going to see different things, different things will jump out. They might have some knowledge or training, whatever they bring in, and they go, oh, actually, I can see this whole other thing going on here. So, um, yeah, so it's not that it's not that I think that everyone's dumb and the texts are brainy on, on a simplistic sense, mm. but it is to say methodologically mm. this is about placing the text at the centre of our of our inquiry. Mm. And um, I think the the there can be a risk and, and ultimately it can be kind of unsatisfying to just have a whole lot of ideas about like this is what I think an indigenous text will do. And now I'm going to chop up the little bits that I think fit what I already expected and I'm going to prove myself right and boom, there I've engaged with the text. Well, 
I don't think that's very satisfying. Mm -hmm. You don't learn anything new because all you've done is decided that you still agree with yourself mm -hmm. and someone else agrees with you too because you made them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what becomes much more productive is the idea of going, I don't, I might not know. I don't know what's going to be in this archive. And we had that really beautiful moment in the archive recently with Ammon where he was like, just like, kind of fell off his chair <laughs> and he was like, I just can't believe this exists. Where he, you know, found a, mm -hmm. something that he literally didn't know existed, which mm -hmm. is now going to be central to his mm -hmm. master's project, right? And mm -hmm. and the ridiculousness and the, the kind of... Um, it's just like the waste of timeness of mm -hmm. just kind of thinking that you're going to just go get the stuff that you want because you already expect it's going to be there mm -hmm. as opposed to going into the archive or going to the individual mm -hmm. text and saying right what's going on mm -hmm. you know how can I learn from this mm -hmm. what's in here that I don't know mm -hmm. well how can this challenge me um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I've found from a lot of the texts that um, you know that I've been working with in Te Aho, but in lots and lots of other texts as well is is um you know, the number of texts that um, that check my expectations. Yeah, so mm. um, Phil Deloria is an American Indian scholar who talks about, um, uh, his, his famous book is called Indians in Unexpected Places, and his idea is that, you know, we kind of have all these um, sort of uh, moments where we go, oh, I didn't expect to find an Indian there, mm. right? And, um, and the point is not that this is kind of just an, an aberration and like, oh, mm. that's random. Um, but to kind of really use that as an opportunity to reflect on why we have a set of expectations mm -hmm. that would mean that that would seem mm -hmm. sort of, you know, strange, strange right? Yeah. And so I think one of the things that is really amazing is when you read something and you go, man, I so didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. I so didn't expect that Jackie Sturm in the 1960s would be saying in a book review that we need more Māori science fiction. <laughs> didn't expect that. Yeah. Um, okay, why didn't I expect that? Why did I not think that someone would be thinking like that? Mm. Um, what do I not understand about the place of genre fiction? Mm. Um, what do we collectively assume about mm. how genre fiction is something that Māori have only come to really in probably the 21st century? You know, mm. So this idea of the text being brainier than us mm. um, is also about kind of being prepared to learn things because, mm. hey, that's what research is about, mm. um, as opposed to kind of getting the texts and, and, and making them confirm what we already agree mm -hmm. what we already believe in to some extent any researcher is going to be doing that right to some extent anyone you know their that you know my engagement with Jackie Sturm's work is going to be different than someone else's engagement and we could say that is because of that's what I'm bringing to it and there's a limitation there and to some extent it's already confirmed right but, it, but what, what we're talking about here is a kind of a a, a willingness yeah. to um to you know one of the things one of the phrases I'll often use is kind of being sort of humble to the job you know mm -hmm. kind of a willingness to kind of be like oh, I don't actually have to know everything here mm -hmm. um, I can go in and find out about stuff mm -hmm. and um, and not with the intention of then um, knowledge leading to possession but mm -hmm. in a colonial sense mm -hmm. um, but instead um, thinking about this in a fuck of a sense mm -hmm. of connection mm -hmm. right of like things being connected and not just in like the Pākehā kind of family tree sense in one direction, but that all connection is kind of part of this incredible multinodal web, yeah, mm -hmm. and so this is just an opportunity to kind mm -hmm. of like um, understand a little bit more of this connection, mm -hmm. and then to ask ourselves questions, why didn't we know about this one, mm -hmm. right? Why didn't I know about the Māori writers who have been published in Mana Journal in Fiji? Why didn't mm. I know about our Uncle Karapu Kitapu having written a poem about Hawaii that was published in Fiji? Why didn't I know about that? Mm. Um, why didn't I know about people, you know? So, yeah, this idea of kind of, um, you yeah, know, being humble, humble to the job, eh? Mm. Yeah.